this uh, presentation. And this presentation is part of a series uh, that depicts the research from uh, Khalifa University related to COVID-19. Uh, in our case, we're going to try to um, expose the work of a large team of people that are interested in uh, data issues, uh, how to link data to models and how to link those models to public health and public health actions. Um, at this point in time, uh, what we want is to, so I am not able, okay, good, thank you. So uh, it is important to understand that when we are dealing with a situation like this and when we're dealing with a pandemic, uh, we need to understand not only the aspects of disease, but the decision making process that happens behind closed doors and out in the open that basically tells people what to do, where to do, when to go, how to do it, etc., etc. And it's paramount that research happens related to all of those aspects and that research leads the way in the generation of knowledge as it relates to public health and the actions that we need to take. Uh, if you can go with the first slide. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, in the pandemic, what we can do is uh, first and foremost understand the, the disease. Okay, uh, the, the disease, and you know all is uh, produced, COVID-19 is produced by a virus of the family of the uh, coronavirus and it has common characteristics but this one has some very specific characteristics of its own and that's what has made this situation different and has made this situation uh, very complicated to handle. I am going to have to see the presentation there because I cannot get the slides here. Okay, now we're on. Yes. So, um, first and foremost, uh, before I start with the topic, I would like to uh, thank all the team that has worked. And that's what you see in the slide is a collaboration between five institutions Khalifa University, Saha, the uh, Abu Dhabi Department of Health, Daman, and Cleveland Clinic of Abu Dhabi. And you see everybody that has collaborated in this, um, in this work that is, has been ongoing for the past month and a half. First and foremost, we need to focus on the virus. Uh, the virus, as I was explaining, is a virus from the coronavirus family, but it has very specific characteristics. And those specific characteristics allow the virus to jump from uh, the uh, initial uh, supposition of the bat then to the pangolin and then to humans. Um, some theories are there, out there, and probably you have seen whether this comes from a laboratory and is a man-made virus or whether it comes from nature. There is no evidence that is uh, right now supporting the fact that this was a virus produced in a laboratory uh, but more that it comes from nature and we just have a freak mutation that have uh, allowed the virus to go and produce the disease into humans. 
The disease has quite unique characteristics. It first affects the respiratory system. When a virus re affects the respiratory system, it has the particularity of becoming very infectious very easily because it can be transmitted through either droplets or air or a combination of both, uh, but most importantly because just speaking and communicating as you regularly do allows the virus to go from infected persons to uh, persons that are susceptible. As you have seen, there was a debate about a month and a half ago to two months ago on whether the mask would help, and now we know that because of the transmission and because of the studies that have supported the amount of time that the, the virus lives, if you can say that the virus lives in any way but can become active or remain active in surfaces, depends on those droplets falling into those surfaces or in your hands and then remaining in those conditions in the surfaces which then are touched by other people and they get infected. So it's a virus that is characterized by a high infectivity. So high that we have gone from just a handful of cases, uh, not even three months ago, to more than four million cases this morning around the world, with a high death toll of around 280,000 people dying because of the condition. This is not to say those that have died because of the condition overwhelming the health system and not allowing other people with other diseases to access the system or because the system, the health system, cannot cope with those that are ill or critically ill with this condition. In UAE, we have been uh, relatively lucky, and I say relatively lucky because this is not just about luck, but it's about a good response from respect from the authorities and uh, the health systems. And uh, we now live in one of the safest countries in the world related to the control actions to uh, decrease the impact and uh, the mitigation efforts to decrease the impact of the pandemic. One of the characteristics of this pandemic and why this is not just a common cold, as some people say it is still, is that it kills people more frequently than other viruses. It does not keep, kill people as frequent among those infected as SARS or MERS, uh, which we knew uh, just a few years ago, but as you saw a few years ago, those uh, outbreaks were relatively easily contained because the disease was not of such high infectivity. So it killed more people, but it was not so infective. What has made this pandemic special is the combination of a high infectivity and the capacity to kill people about 10 times more frequent than the common cold or influenza. So, one particular aspect that is important to mention is that it kills more people if you are older or if you have other conditions that are related to either circulatory or respiratory systems. Uh, this is very important because one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is the stratification of how this pandemic responds and how these mitigation efforts respond to the overall number of cases and the capacity to overwhelm the health system by this disease based on the projections of such number of cases. So we enter a very particular uh, aspect of this condition and is what we call or has been called uh, it sounds musical, even in the common term, which is the flatten the curve. So it has been hashtagged all over the place. Uh, people talk about it and it became very, very popular. And mitigation, social isolation, uh, became the most important way to actually get that curve flattened. So what is that concept and why is that important? When an outbreak of an infectious disease happens, 
the number of cases because of infectivity starts uh, going up and it goes up at a rate that is defined by the capacity of the infectious agent of uh, produced disease on people, the amount of time that that person is going to be contagious, so that is going to be able to transmit the disease to others, and by how much time is spent between that person infects another and then that other starts developing uh, the, either the systems or becoming contagious to other individuals. If you leave that phenomenon alone, then the curve grows to a point where there is a balance between those that are susceptible, which in this case we assume that it was the whole humankind. Everybody was susceptible because it was a new virus and there is no cross immunity, at least so far yet proven with other viruses. So we assume that everybody could have been infected or could be infected by this virus. Then those that get infected and then those that recover and in the same way that other viruses, we assume that they become immune to at least the same virus that infected them, not necessarily to the same virus when it mutates, which is a different aspect of the disease. As you know, for instance, in common cold or influenza, the viruses mutate rapidly, and that's why we need to reinvent the vaccine every year in order to capture those that were more frequent, assuming that those are going to reinfect the most people next time. However, we always get new mutations. We don't know how this virus is going to progress. Uh, there is the assumption that based on the characteristic that I so far have mentioned, that we're going to have this virus with us for a very, very long time. Now, is it going to be in the form of a pandemic or an outbreak? Probably not probably is going to become seasonal, which means that it will appear in, in slower or smaller peaks and then it will disappear. However, in this case, that growth of the initial curve of the pandemic without any other uh, mitigation efforts or any immunity will tend to go to a peak where it will produce the most amount of cases and the most damage, the most amount of deaths. If you produce too many sick people and those people are seriously ill, like those produced by COVID-19, then you need to hospitalize them in high, um, high complexity systems like the ICUs and you have to use very specific machines to support life such as the ventilators. We know that the ventilators are not as necessary as they used to be or we used to think that they would be at the beginning because we thought that this disease was produced by a trend, by a lack of capacity of the oxygen to go from one part of the air, which is the alveoli, into the circulation because that membrane would get inflamed and would get very, very thick by water and other products, proteins mostly. We know now that a, an important part of the disease is produced by the damage of the coagulation and then with those alveoli shut down, it doesn't matter if you have respirator or not, uh, you will still have a problem. But there is an intermediate point where you can get better by drugs on the coagulation system and you can maintain the life of those people with a ventilator to the utmost extreme so they can get better and then they can break the barrier between dying and not dying, which is very thin in this particular disease. So we do need the ventilators. Uh, they are not as essential for the survival as we thought that they would be in the beginning. And uh, they, together with other therapy, anticoagulant therapy now, given to most of these patients critical in critical stages, uh, produce a better survival in the overall disease. Now, so I have explained that if that peak goes up and down fast, the duration of the pandemic is going to be shorter. However, the number of cases is going to be so large that there is no capacity in any health system 
to handle this amount of patients. We saw that in Italy, we saw that in Germany, we saw that in Spain. However, because for instance, the cases were different in Germany uh, than in Italy and Spain, and there was not such an overwhelming situation in the system, mortality in Germany was kept to a minimum due to these and other factors. However, Italy and Spain, and now the United States of America, are, uh, uh, have their systems quite overwhelmed by the patients and their severe cases especially, and the death rate is much higher than in other places. This is not only caused by this situation, it's also caused by the distribution of age amongst the population. So as I say, if mortality is higher among older, that means that an older population is going to be in principle more susceptible to have people in critical stages and dying because of this disease. So all of these factors and others that we don't have time to mention cause this situation. Now, uh, these are elements that are important for what I'm going to talk next, and that is how do we model mathematically the curves of these pandemics or these outbreaks. So basically, uh, models are representations of reality. You have seen models everywhere. People talk about modeling everywhere, every day, in many, many different things. So you can have physical models, like the ones that architects do or engineers do. You can have computer models, you can have blueprint models, you can have many, many models. So what it is, in essence, is a representation of reality that helps you do, in essence, two things. Either project what you have as a reality in your mind, so you based your information on previous experiences, and then you project with that information into what you imagine that is going to happen next, or you take all of the information plus information of things that are not or have not happened, but you can predict that they will happen, and then you can make your model a predictive one. I am not a mathematician, so I will not get into the mathematics. Uh, the, my partner in this research, the PI actually for the mathematical model, Dr. Uh, Jorge Rodriguez uh, is the mathematician in the group. So I am going to just talk about how we, those who are not mathematicians, use uh, these models to actually produce what we do on an everyday basis, which is function with our patients and move health systems uh, throughout uh, the, the pandemic. So some models are very simple and some others are extremely, extremely complicated. It doesn't matter whether your model is simple or complicated. One important point that I want to uh, highlight is that if you're trying to talk about the future, every model is inaccurate. So, so uh, they help you as much as you help them figure out how those curves are going to Act. You have seen by now that many people, many models, predicted but by now, that by now we would be over with this phenomenon. And here we are. So why have these models failed? Probably because the predictions were done first as a projection based on very, very few data. Second, too many assumptions were made. And third, there was no data. Plus, you didn't put into the model other factors, other determinants that would affect the shape of that curve. So at the end, it's just anybody's guess. You have seen that the US, which has now about one third of the world cases just there, has tried to use many models from many uh, very uh, good institutions and basically at any given point in time, all those models have failed. Uh, why? Because people have too large of a, an expectation about what can the model provide. So a model helps you 
gain understanding on the shape of the outbreak. It helps predict to some extent the course of the timeline of the outbreak. So what I was explaining that if you allow the outbreak to run wild, then everybody's going to get infected fast, everybody's going to get infected fast, and then it's going to be a shorter duration with devastating consequences. So what we try to do is to mitigate the number of new cases and spread out the cases throughout time. So the first impact that is uh, actually a desirable impact is that we make the disease longer than it was going to be. So one of the things that people do not understand is that if you project an outbreak based on a peak unmodified um, intervention and it was going to last about two months or a month and a half, but then you mitigate, you cannot keep saying that we're going to reach the peak by April or mid-April or end April or beginning of May and then that the outbreak is going to end by mid-May because here we are in mid-May and so far we have the disease almost everywhere, even in those places where we were trying to, uh, that, that were already going down. Uh, what is very, very crucial is that the models could be relatively accurate, not on the end point. The farther you try to predict, the more inaccurate you're going to be. So if you try to predict relatively short term, you're going to have a much better chance of having at least a range of possibilities to act upon. So it helps us to predict needed resources. And those resources help us to predict, in turn, the impact of those interventions. So how much do we need and how much impact are we expected to have? Now, once we change the curve, everything else is going to change again. So we cannot expect to have a prediction made on two weeks or three weeks in the future, act upon it now, and then expect the, end, end, the same end point. It does not happen that way. So we need to readjust consistently, almost ideally on a daily basis, and then we can forecast a little bit better what's in the immediate future and what would happen long term if we would, do, if we would not do anything or if we would do some interventions that we can model as well as part of the model. Uh, of course, we need data for that. So that's why we partner with a lot of institutions that are in the forefront that are not only uh, seeing these patients but are also uh, managing the um, outbreak uh, with and producing the data that we should feed into these models. The models of, of epidemics have been handled similarly for quite a long time. So we, we have a very popular, which is the SIR model, which models the, as you see in this uh, more or less complex slide, the susceptible, infected and recover and almost anything that you model within these models is going to have a variation of different stages or different types of uh, transmission of the disease, etc., etc. What is important is that we start with a population that is mixed, all susceptible, or at least partially susceptible, and then those are going to be infected and a portion of those infected are going to recover and a portion of those are going to become critical and then so on and so on. So I will explain that more in the context of COVID-19 in a later stage. So the compartments that are made reflect the natural uh, course of the disease. Now, can you impact that natural course? And the answer is well, you better, because if you don't, then you're going to have a pretty bad outbreak. You're going to have too many people ill, and you're going to have too many dying unnecessarily, because you could have impacted uh, in, in some way. That's why we're trying to develop vaccines. That's why we are trying to develop uh, medications. And the purpose of the vaccines is what we call primary prevention. 
is to avoid disease at all. So not to allow the disease to produce itself. Now, if we don't have a vaccine, what we can do is impact those that are diseased and try to allow them a better possible prognosis that they can have. Now we know that there are proportions of those that if we don't do anything, they will die. But if we intervene at different stages, less are going to become critical, less are going to become uh, ventilator dependent, less are going to die. So impacting with interventions changes the distribution of those compartments that you see now in blue, changes the probabilities, changes the models. Um, one of the basic uh, important uh, situations that need to be analyzed in these diseases is how much infectivity has this organism, does this organism have. So in this case, we can summarize that infectivity by a number that is called the R0 or R0. And basically, the basic reproduction number means how many people am I going to be able to infect with one person that is infected. In this case, the number is somewhere between two and three. Some people manage that infectivity in these models as a fixed number, but what we know is that that number changes almost on an everyday basis, especially in an outbreak. Because you start with high infectivity, and because of the interventions, you end up decreasing infectivity. Uh, so people are less infectious to others, so people infect less others. If we theoretically could identify early, each one person, as soon as that person is infected and starts becoming infectious to others, we could quarantine them and allow no more infections to happen. But because this disease has an asymptomatic stage where you could infect others, that has been one of the most devastating characteristics of the current situation. That's why we have mostly the pandemic that we have now in our hands. If we would only be infective when we would become symptomatic, this would be a whole different disease. For instance, if you have other diseases that manifest quite obviously, for instance, with skin uh, lesions, like measles, then in the infectious is by direct contact. So if you don't have a skin lesion, you don't have direct contact. If you don't have direct contact, infecting others is very difficult. Even though these diseases have very high level of infectivity, you can understand how to stop the transmission because you see it. Here, we do not see the virus, we do not see those that are infectious until it's a little bit too late. So basically, if we have R zeros that are higher than one, means that one person can infect more than one person. So the curve of the disease increases, the number of infected people increases. If the number is less than one, means that one person infects less than other ones. So there will be always less and less and less people to be infected. That's what characterizes the second part of one of these pandemic curves where we have less and less and less people infected until one day it will not disappear, but it probably will fade away and either become what we call endemic, which is there will be some cases here and there, and one of these days with the right conditions, then we will have more cases, and that's what we call usually uh, seasonality in the presence of these outbreaks. So, but we, let's, let's pretend that mathematically speaking, we can calculate an R0 for the overall number of diseases throughout a long period of time that we can compress in a short time. We have R zeros then for different diseases, and that allows us to compare them for infectiveness. So you see that what I was saying 
measles that is airborne and also contagious by by direct contact has an uh, an R0 and R0 that is quite high, very, very infectious. However, we see it, we understand it, we can isolate. Uh, COVID-19 has a number that is not so high, but because we don't see it and we cannot isolate everybody that is infected, then contagious in close proximity is very, very easy to happen. And that's why the countries that have not had social isolation or protective personal equipment like masks or gloves have not done very well. Now, some of those have done well. For instance, Sweden. So Sweden is now uh, a natural laboratory for a country that decided not to shut down not to isolate people, just distance them, but let them be. So now we know that compared with other neighboring countries, they have had more cases and more deaths. However, they have not had by far as many deaths as other places. We need to understand that social distancing, uh, in order to be effective, you need a very disciplined population. So when you have a society that is very conscientious of the greater good of the whole social group, you might be able to do that with lesser consequences. But if you go to other places where you have other social conditions and you say it's social diseases is the way to go, you don't need to be isolated. Uh, people are not so disciplined and then you might have a chaotic situation in order to uh, just do that as a single measure. So some places need to go full isolation mandated by the government and it works for them. So please do not think on the arguments in the internet that say that because Sweden did well without shutting down, every place in the world can shut down. That is not correct. It's not a function of one single thing. It's one single, single thing in the context of everything else that you have for that place. So, uh, as I was explaining to you, the serial interval, which is the interval of time between uh, the uh, infectiousness of one person and the beginning of the symptoms of the other person is important because the shorter there is, the more infective, infectious that is the condition. For COVID-19, we're not going to spend more time uh, explaining this. It is very short, so that together with all of the other factors make the disease different and make the disease severe. Uh, we need to understand that all of these models work based on uh, different inputs and parameters that need to be inputted in the model. And then again, I am not going to stop uh, explaining the mathematical foundations of these to a lot of extent, but many different models exist. Some are conditional. Some provide you with a rule of conditionality that determines that you would go here or there given certain conditions that happen. To some extent, we're going to be using those parameters and those conditions related to COVID-19 and we are going to be able to input them into the uh, curves that you have seen for other uh, models and the ones that I'm going to be showing you. Many of these models have to work because of lack of data on assumptions. So in these, um, in these conditions, the epidemic uh, model that, that, that is used assumes that transmission is a stochastic process, that people in communities are represented as nodes, that people are mixed, uh, that there are connections between people, that some people are more connected by others and you could potentially model all of these things into your mathematical models 
However, these are not modeled in the one that we published and I'm going to present to you uh, because of limitation of data and limitation of time. The more parameters is the basic principle that you can model that are true, the better your model is going to be in predict the next immediate uh, outcome of your, of your determinations that will help you implement some resources uh, seeking activities or interventions to manipulate the way that you think the curve was going to go. Uh, the main limitations are that uh, sometimes you need large computational power to model some of these uh, parameters and um, in this case usually for pandemics the things happen so fast that it's impossible to model all social and all biological situations, condition parameters that you would have liked to uh, involve in your modeling. And of course, one of the key situations is that your prediction and your forecasting of the future is as good as your probabilities of transitioning to a stage and parameters modifying that transition is, uh, is real. So sometimes we just have to think and, and work with the best scenario on what was the probability of jumping from this stage to this stage because we don't know. In COVID-19, for instance, we do not know what is the exact proportion of the people that are asymptomatic that progress from asymptomatic and, and, and non-infectious to asymptomatic infectious and when does that happen, for how long. We have a good evidence that is somewhere two to four days, but in one of these models, two or four is a big difference in, in the curve that is going to be projected into the, into the future. So basically, uh, in these curves, as the susceptible, which is, we assume, 100% goes down, the number of recovered or died, meaning that they are not susceptible anymore, is going to go up. And hopefully those curves are going to cross as soon as possible, as low as possible. So hopefully we would we would need the less amount of people infected with minimal um, severity of the disease in order to get the most people non-susceptible because they become immune. It's not the case with COVID-19. Why? <clears throat> because the proportion of people that get infected, that end up in critical stages, is higher than with other diseases that are equivalent and I keep comparing with them because many people have compared them and say this is like the common cold, this is like the flu. No, that proportion is also higher. So it's a more serious disease, more infectious disease, uh, that's why it's different and much worse than uh, a regular seasonal cold or influenza. Uh, we have two types of curves that are modeled in this, in this pandemic. The first one is the number of cumulative cases and the second one is the uh, number of cases per day. The number of cumulative cases is the one that is consistently shown in the, for instance, in the John Hopkins um, um, website uh, that is on the lower right hand side and it shows an ever-increasing until it plateaus number of cases. So it just plots how many cases are there or have been diagnosed with the disease. And it goes from one until there are no more cases. You can never go down because it always plots the, uh, the, the total number of cases. Uh, the other curves, which are the ones that people like to model the most, are the ones that depict the number of cases usually per day in a pandemic. So of course you have first a few cases, one case, then you have three, then you have nine, and so on and so on. So it, start, it starts growing and then when there is a balance between susceptibility measures 
and those that are uh, infecting others is going to start going down and you will see that the number of cases go down. Uh, these curves represent uh, the last one China, the second one Netherlands, the third one Germany and you see that uh, there are a certain number of cases that at some point plateaus and when you reach that plateau you want to think yet yeah, you are at least more or less halfway into the phenomenon. What you see in these curves is that they are very symmetrical. So once you're going up, it's very difficult to predict the other side of the curve. Once you reach the top, it's, more, it's lesser difficult to predict the rest, but once you're going down, it's easier to predict the end. So typically these models become more accurate in the prediction of the end date when they are able to predict how, uh, in wh which part of the curve you are at. So if you're going up, very difficult to predict even when the, the climax of the number of cases per day is going to be. But everybody likes the models because th there is a sense of hope when you're going up on somebody telling you in two weeks this is over. You reach your peak, you're going to start going down. Well, have we been wrong lately in those models? Yes, we have. Uh, so now let's get into the last part of the presentation, which I am going to try to uh, summarize as much as I can. And this is a paper that was published, so because you can find it in the internet now, you can read it, uh, everything is explained there. And then again, I am not the mathematician in the group, so I will try my best to tell you not what was done there by Jorge, but what I can do with it as a physician, as a public health person, to better my life and those out there that are really, really worried with this disease. Basically, we have stages of the disease. So we have pre-symptomatic, that are non-infectious, which is everybody in the population that has not been infected. And a proportion of those are going to get infected, but a proportion is going to just keep going. And hopefully, if they don't get immune by these, we at some point will have a vaccine and make them immune. However, there is a vast proportion of those that are not going to be infected that will remain susceptible to disease. And this is a very important point that I want to make because now everybody is just tired of being inside, indoors, isolated, far away, not able to do what you want to do, especially in this time of the year, especially in those countries that have a summer that is a functional one, not as hot as here. And they want to go to the beach and they want to get together with people and they cannot do it. So they get tired and now they say, okay, the government can uh, allow us to go out because this is, this is over. Well, this is not over. So if you start going out and only a fraction of the population has become uh, uh, immune, then there is most of people susceptible. So we are all expecting, and you have heard it, of a new peak to start as soon as people start going out and uh, most of those people being not recovered, but still susceptible population. Now, each one of these subgroups can be stratified, in this case, by age. Why? Because age is an important predictor of mortality and of needing critical uh, care. So each one of these groups we stratify by age, also by group. What we end up with is with a, a, a more complex model of transition between stages by subgroup. And now we can also model mitigation uh, efforts such as the use of distancing and isolation 
or using personal protective equipment, which are the two things that work the most. So all of these parameters were modeled, and this is one of the tables that you will see in our paper, but what you can see is that the level of probability, and this is the highlighted region that you see there, is going to be higher given that we know that age is a factor on reaching critical stages or compartments of the disease. So aside from everything that I have shown, we also model that. So basically, the way that we establish the proportions is to take all of those that are acceptable, then the number of contacts per acceptable, then the number or the proportions of those that would get infected, and then the probability of infection per contact. So the rate of infection is not only modified by the natural course of disease, but by the level of intervention that we have. And then we model those by other interventions that you see there. And then we try to come up with a number at the end that is the one that people are hoping that can be useful to propose different course of management with the disease and try to forecast what is going on. So then again, all of these are the interventions parameters per age group and all of them were modeled. And I want to just skip these because all of these are in the paper and you can consult them and just go straight into the results. So as you see, Many models of those that you have seen and that are available, they show only one curve. And that one curve is per population, so it helps little those that are trying to manage all the aspects of the infection and the pandemic in the health system. So here you see that the dynamic of the number of critical cases per age group, for instance, in the graph that you see on the right-hand side, is very different if you model what happens to youngsters as opposed to what happens with old people. So elderly is going to react differently, produces, producing a high amount of cases that are critical, many more by being a proportionate, more, uh, more uh, susceptible to reach end stage of severe forms of the disease than the young population. The only reason to show you that is just to show you how they react different based on the, on the data that we have. The data that we have, that Jorge used, by the way, is mostly from Spain. Now we're trying to fit this model to local data. Here is when you isolate people, you see that you produce an impact. And then the curves are no longer what you saw, but the ones that you see. So if you do not isolate people, you're going to have a very steep curve that is going to produce a high number of critical cases. But if you isolate people, then there is no more transmission, at least the one that you can control the most, and then you're going to have a very flat curve that is going to last longer throughout time. And that is exactly what we are seeing in the real uh, numbers that we are getting from these populations. And we can do this by the extent of testing <coughs> that is performed. Why? Because we can selectively isolate those that test positive, providing an advantage over the disease. So that's why the long-term future that we see for this disease involves frequent an abundant testing of those that do not feel anything. So we can say you are susceptible, so you have to be very careful on not getting infected. 
you are or have been infected, you are no longer susceptible and you are infected but you are still transmitting the virus so you must be uh, quarantined, isolated so you cannot infect other people. If we could do that differentiation in the population, we would no longer have any problem handling this pandemic. But as we cannot do that just yet, <coughs> we have to use PPE and now we can see and we can model on the, mo on the curve in the right hand side as well that the more you use PPE, the more you flatten that curve. So the less number of rapid acute cases and the lesser proportion of people reaching critical levels of the disease you will have. That's why almost everybody, almost every government is mandating, even the ones that have released people from isolation or social distancing, they tell them, please use masks. Now, people do not always obey their governments. That's why you see so many pictures or even of even very populated places now and people not wearing their masks. And of course, you can model the availability of ICU beds, which are critical in whether a critical case is going to die or not. So basically what we are showing here is that the more ICU beds you have to handle those that become critical, the better the prognosis and the lesser number of deaths you will have, up to a point. So, just to end, where we are now is we are now handling local data on many of these cases and trying to input the model with parameters or with data coming from these parameters so the model can now predict here, not predict, try to predict here based on elsewhere. Some of the things that we know of the disease change little from place to place. But as I was pointing out, it is absurd that either scientists or politicians or government take a place like Sweden as an example for what they must do in their own countries. There are many, many factors. One of those is what the society has been like before and what is now. In Asia, social distancing is the norm is the way to go. That does not happen in Hispanic population in the Americas. So when you talk about social distancing to an Asian country, it's very different than when you try to talk about social distancing to a country that is a Latin American country. Well, everybody touches everybody, everybody hugs everybody, that's the way to go. So it's very important that we do not extrapolate a single parameter from any country to try to determine what is going to happen in other countries, much less what we should do in other countries with our populations. We need, hopefully, data from other cities to model these to other cities, and hopefully we are going to be able to decrease the amount of new cases, spread them out through time, and try to be sensitive to the amount of the capacity that the health system has. It doesn't matter how much you feed into the system in the way of resources, the health system will always have a bottleneck, whether it's supplies, whether it's physical plant, whether it's human resources, whether it's whatever. So you cannot take the whole system and increase the capacity. You increase the capacity, but there will be one of these aspects that you will not be able to increase. So we need to be very sensitive. We need to increase testing. UAE is probably the best country in the world regarding testing. We're still in the growing phase of the uh, curve, at least here in UAE. 
So we need to be still very careful on trying to handle social distancing and use of PPE because that is the way to go. And please remember that there is a lot of information in the internet that you should not really implement. The first one is any person, authority or not, that says that this is a virus that you can disinfect by drinking or injecting yourself with anything. Uh, some people say that because it's, it's, it's heat kills it or inactivates it faster that putting an, an air dryer in your mouth or, or breathing uh, uh, hot water vapors or a, a steam is, is going to uh, make you better. Uh, it, it does not. It has been proven that it does not do that and you will burn yourself. You will, you will burn your mucosas, then the virus is going to have a better chance to infect you. Uh, there are no proven medications yet yet. There are good candidates, but there are no proven medications. And first and foremost, there is no vaccine up in the near future. There are some news lately, as late as yesterday, of immune therapy for the virus. We need to see. We need to see what were the results, what was the research, if it's not just an observation, such as what happened with hydroxychloroquine, uh, or if it's a real thing. Uh, you need to understand that social isolation is the best single measure altogether with uh, use of PPE right now to handle the pandemic. So if we keep doing that, we're going to keep in the good side of the progression of the disease. And as I always end by saying, in these situations, you need to be very, very patient. You need to be safe. You need to be sensitive. You need to be very well informed. You need to be nice to others. You need to be prudent. And far and foremost, you need to be productive. Economic impact is undoubtedly so the most the biggest concern probably in in governments uh, right now and is pushing some of these countries to do things that might be very dangerous for the people so we don't want to just release everything and pretend that life is going to go to normal we need to be again clever sensitive informed and to keep in this situation here in the UAE, we have a good government that have been very sensible, that have been very balanced, that have been very informed. Uh, we need to follow the indications, we need to follow the guidelines, and we're going to be still in the good side of the world, uh, having UAE as one of the safest countries to be in the current COVID-19 pandemic. You can access our model online in this link you will have it uh, i guess in the recording so you can get to it later so you can model your own scenarios and and produce the curves and and see how they are and how they become and at this time if uh, there are any and we have some time because we started a little bit late um, if you have any questions that i can answer i would be uh, okay, so uh, Q&A is going to be in my email, uh, so I will try to, uh, on email, uh, answer as many of those as I can. For now, I thank you, you all, and I hope that this has been useful and informative, and um, I will, I guess, um, see you next time. Thank you very much.